university students, when we teach them these stories in full, in full, perhaps we are saying that humanity is not to be trusted, that every once in a while seems to think we be. One people is killing another. Before World War II and after. After you had Rwanda, you had Cambodia, you had South Sudan, you had the whole country. Mass killings go on. And when we teach them as they were, as they were, with all the details, aren't we harming their souls? Aren't we telling them that, that humanity should not be trusted? That every once in a while such a thing can be done. But we want to, to teach them and for, with values, values of humanity, of peace, of democracy. But these stories are not, not alone the way of peace and democracy, etc. So, this is one question that I am asking myself and you, because I heard. Because uh, Yad Vashem, it's the memorial authority in Israel, of which I was the historian for some 10 years. Now I gave the floor to younger people. I'm just an advisor. But we have also terrible pictures and photos and, uh, and testimonies. If we teach them in full, what do we do? That's the first question. Another question that is also common to us, to you and to us, is the question of the place of God. And with you of the church, with us of the rabbis and the waiting Jews in exile, we were in exile for 2,000 years, waiting for the Messiah, the Messiah to come and take us back to the land of Israel. So he didn't come, but we organized ourselves politically, came back to the end of Israel, established the state. But there is a question there, because Jews were asking themselves during the Holocaust, during the killings, during all the steps before and, and during the terrible killings and cruelty. Where is God? Where is God? Why doesn't he do something to stop? He, it is being done to his people who believe in him. Where is he to stop? And there were heavy questions and heavy accusations even against the rabbis. The rabbis were religious leaders to ask them, what, did, what are you doing if you were in the world? What did you do? Why didn't you tell us to run away? Why didn't you tell us to defend us? To, to escape, to do something else than waiting for the Messiah. This waiting didn't do us any good. They just did us. And uh, there were many complaints to which, to which I come uh, on another point against the Catholic Church that did not help the Jews most. Some churches and monasteries did hide Jews in Belgium, in Poland, in France, mainly in these three countries. But the Pope, the Pope, passed away. He was the Pope during the war and after he passed away. Every year, he stands on the balcony in Peter and speaks to all the world in the square and to all the world. They always on Christmas and December, and he spoke in 1942, which was the middle, exactly the middle of a year, the most terrible year for the middle of 1943. He didn't say, Oh, I know what's going on, I know that they are killing Jews and gypsies and the communists. And I'm against it, and I will excommunicate whoever gives the hand to the Nazis. No, he did not say that. And we 
you remember that. We, it, it, uh, it remained within Israeli Jewish mentality that the church didn't, and didn't come out, out strongly. And so, it is not only a lot about you before I came. Today, you could see more about the role of the church here. And so, what do we do when we teach? That's my second question. What do we do when we teach youngsters the whole story with the whole details, with all, with all the accusations? And we speak about the church or the Jewish rabbis. And we say, sorry, no good. You failed the test. You cooperated. And what do we do to this young soul whom we want to grow up believing in the good of humankind, in God, in the uh, the right mind of the religious leaders, in the, the way they, in the just way that they would lead their believers. We put again the question mark, the heavy question. Then there is uh, a third question. I told you that uh, I have four. Don't worry, only four, not five and six. And <clears throat> The third one um, concerns other nations. The Holocaust happened over most of Europe. Okay? Many countries were conquered by the Germans and they part, not everyone, not even not everyone, but large parts of societies helped the Germans either collect the Jews or bring them to the place of healing, or looting their property, etc. And you ask yourself, how can, that's the third question, how can you teach, raise children, and teach them to trust other nations and their attitudes to you, not just to Jews? For instance, I think this incident that we were told about, not an incident, it's a tragedy, that we were told about in Nyanza, that there were UN soldiers, UN soldiers, Belgians, I think, yeah? Belgians, and they were in school a few days, and protected the two people who were in the school. But then, at a certain point, they decided, or they were ordered, I'm not sure this point is totally clarified, but they left. And after they left, there was the killing, that happened, the, the, the marching, and the killing of these three innocent people. So, we also have the same question of trusting other nations. These were United Nations, from Belgium, but the United Nations. You know that before the Six Day War, we had a war in 1967. Before the war, Israel was a young country, even, not even 20 years old, was threatened by Egypt, by other neighbors, with whom we now have peace, with Jordan, with Egypt. But then, before the war, they threatened to wipe away for Israel to take it off the world and off the map. And there were UN soldiers in Israel who were in between, in between with Egypt, in the Sinai Desert, in between Jordan, on the Jordan River, in between the North, Lake of Kinneret. I'm sure you know these places as Christian, the Lake of Kinneret, the Jordan River, etc. They were there doing the job. But then, Again, one day, one day during this tense, very tense period in which we were threatened, they decided to leave. They should trust the other. The next day, they either decided or were ordered, they left. 
and they didn't care about what would happen to us if Egypt really invaded. Okay, we had a smashing victory that's beside the point. They didn't know what would happen. They left us in a very difficult time. So again, it's a question. It's my third question. How do you teach, how do you keep values of trusting other nations, of having international corporations, of being members of international bodies? Now Rwanda, I understand, has become a place, a major center of conventions. You had the common way, it was all over the world, and the common way the countries had their convention here in Kigali. You had East African uh, uh, cooperation among the nations, etc. We in Israel, or Jews in general, were left with a heavy suspicion against other countries. There is, uh, during this six days war, uh, there was a song that some, someone uh, elaborated, wrote down, and they wrote the melody. That the world is, it is called the world is against us. It is called the world is against us. Okay, never mind, we we'll overcome. But the, this suspicion that was born ages ago, but was so strengthened during the world, that you cannot trust others fully. And you had your doubts as well regarding the UN. And it was, it is a heavy question again. Do you trust? Do you teach to trust? I'd like to remind you that there was another incident. Again, I we call it a historical incident, but again a tragedy. During the Balkan Wars in Serbia, in a place called Serbrenice, Serbrenice, there were again UN soldiers from the Netherlands, Dutch soldiers. <laughs> And they again, they didn't want to interfere. The Croatians were killing the Serbs, the Serbs during World War II, and now the Serbs were killing the Croatians. They killed now 9,000 people, and the, and the UN soldiers did not interfere. They were outside, they were not interfering. It was a terrible tragedy. They were interrogated and investigated later, but it was too late. So that was my third question. There is a fourth one, which I'm not sure I had enough time to understand how do you feel about it here in Rwanda. But it is a question that is quite heavy on us in Israel especially, but in other Jewish communities that are still all over the world. The question is, how did our fathers, our grandfathers, grandmothers, during the Holocaust, how did they behave? Did they resist? Could they resist? Did they let themselves be in such a horrible number? Uh, when did they understand that healing is on, that something terrible is on its way? And when they understood, what did they exactly do to prevent? Some communities, for instance in Greece, they could run away. They could run away to the mountains with a blessing. And one city did run away, but in Salonika, Major city Greece with 70 population of 75,000, 56 were put on thousand were put on graves and sent The question is heavy on us because you know that Israel is a country that now defends itself, and we we will not let anyone kill us anymore. The question is heavy regarding former generations. What did they do? Did they do enough? Did they understand too late? The question of resisting 
is helping on us. Because um, you know that under a pressure, under pressure of a situation, situation as you have here, when you know that killing is coming with and you you don't know where to run and you don't know who to warn and you don't know where to hide and it's being under a lot of pressure and you know to always can't really resist or do the right thing on time. And this is what happened to the Jews in the world, who cornered into a corner. They did not have weapons. They did not, most of them, have any military uh, training. They, they were just people living their lives, their families. And they couldn't really resist strong German army or the strong German units who well pressed and well equipped with weapons and uh, and so frightening and they didn't but here I think that both in Rwanda and in Israel and in Israel can at least compare the situation that we have to the situation to situations that happen to other countries where people also were under pressure and under terror and under threat, not knowing what to do when they were coming and knocking the door and ravaging into the place. I give you an example, a striking example. You know that we said that on June 22, the German army invaded with heavy forces invaded the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was surprised, not ready, unfortunately, very unfortunately. And around a bit more than five million Red Army, this was the army of the Soviet Union, Red Army, fell into German city. The Germans who said that they are not they are not taking the Geneva Convention into consideration. They started killing these millions of soldiers and killed more than three million. Three million soldiers in terrible ways. They made them walk on minefields. They Surrounded them so that they couldn't run away and starve them to death. And we did not hear, and we now speak the same story, we did not hear about these soldiers resisting and putting up a fight. Why? So I think the answer is not exactly how the Jews behave or how the Jews behave, it's about teaching how human beings, how persons behave, and how frightened they are when a situation of terror comes in. And it does not say anything about them for being cowards or being brave. Only a few among the Jews could fight, only the young ones, who with a lot of effort acquired some weapons and put up a desperate you couldn't fight the Germans, they were the masters of you. And not only them, most of you, most, most of you did not put up a fight and did not resist. Only later, when the, the, the turn of the wheel of the war came, after the Germans lost a heavy battle in Stalingrad, in the Soviet Union, in the beginning of 1943, but still it took more two and a half years more. So the question is not of nationality. It's not how you or us or others. It's uh, a human question. It again should be taught very carefully and to youngsters who also will be thinking when you tell them about the murder year, about the Holocaust, about other genocide. They will be thinking, they will be criticizing, they will perhaps be criticizing the fathers, 
for the reform integration, there was heavy criticism in Israel. Why didn't why didn't they want it? And we took many years, many years to understand that they couldn't. Today these accusations are over. But they definitely were there. Okay. Um, I'm close to ending because the uh, your teachers or your professors would like you to ask questions. So I will end by telling you uh, the following. <clears throat> because these questions that I posed, the four questions, raise uh, a question of how do, you, how do we teach? How do we still we raise youngsters after prejudice and still bring them up as peaceful and filled with? People, thank you. Peaceful people with value. Okay. I end by telling you that a number of years ago, I was invited to teach in Venice, in this beautiful city in the north of Italy. But it's there on an island, on a small island, there is a small university, really small, a few hundred students. And the, this university was established by eight universities. One from America, one from Italy, one from Israel, one from the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, Spain, etc. Each country sends a number of students every year and a number of professors. Okay, and so me and my husband, we came for a semester and I taught World War II. And I had a class with students from eight countries. Okay, we start World War II, and before long, I understand that the Japanese students don't know anything, almost anything, about Pearl Harbor, about the place where the Japanese attacked and drowned American ships during the war and caused a horrible damage in ships, in the loss of life. And the American students hardly know anything about the atomic bomb that America threw over the heads of two major Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, causing again destruction, horrible loss of life, radiation, radioactivity that lasted for these didn't know about what they did to the Americans. The Americans didn't know what they did to the Japanese. Okay. First of all, I sent them home to study and to give me good papers about what each of them did, which was an eye-opener to them. But then I also asked myself, how come? Why didn't they know? It's a good student. Not that they were taught and were too lazy to learn. No, they were just not taught. Because there is fear. There is fear of teaching the disasters that bring guilt. Feelings of shame and guilt for generations many years after. There is fear. Teachers in both countries did not teach them. And in Japan, the best, uh, the, the book that is a must, a must read in high school is The Diary of Anne Frank. You must have heard of Anne Frank, a Jewish young girl, 13 years old, <clears throat> when she and the family went into hiding in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands because the Germans were already out catching the Jews and they hid them for more than two years. And she wrote a beautiful diary, the diary of Anne Frank. It has been translated into dozens of languages, sold by the millions. It's a show in Broadway, it's a movie in Hollywood. Why was it so popular? And it is still very, and the mass reading in high school. So, she does not write about ghettos. 
What about Joe the band being in hiding? So she wrote with optimism. Perhaps the war will, will be over. And she believed in humanity. The heart of, of, of the brain is good, basically. And so she told you about the war. And she didn't. Because she didn't speak about the major border events, camps and ghettos and that. And so she became a white red, white red all over. Because with her, you could identify with her, the story was easier. So what am I saying? Am I saying that you cannot teach a full story? This is a terrible situation. I'm a historian. I should teach and research, and believe me, this is what I'm doing. Full story. But it raises a question. Heavy question that I try to put to you, and that we shall all consider and think about. Thank you all. Thank you very much for this photo for uh, sharing uh, with us. Uh, is on Christoph Gilma, the student in uh, Masters of Science, Project Management. So uh, I'm not going to respond to the questions you, you gave us, <laughs> but uh, they are very interesting and I'm, I'm still thinking about them. Uh, what interests me is uh, how you you talked about what are we doing now to teach the youth, to teach the young people, uh, so that we can have uh, a bright, a bright future, uh, so that we can uh, say that it will never be uh, any genocide again in the future. So that's something uh, that is very important. So uh, my two. Uh, Questions uh, about uh, two topics or two subjects. Uh, it's about uh, what you have uh, told us uh, that young people, the examples you gave us about uh, the Japanese and the Americans who didn't know about uh, their history. So there's also uh, a fact that young people don't know uh, really the history of. Uh, the country or how the genocide was uh, planned and prepared many years ago before uh, we had the genocide against Tutsi in 1994. So what would you advise, what uh, would you recommend uh, to, to encourage young people to know about uh, the history? And also the other problem we have now is about uh, genocide in Nairobi. And it's also important that it is also among uh, young people we see uh, some young people outside the country uh, who are who have that genocide denial. So what uh, yeah. what is your advice on more fighting uh, genocide denial uh, among young people? Thank you. I hope I I hope I get the answers. Uh, but um, 
uh, I, I, I point out two points. One is that indeed there is no running away from this issue because it's not only a question of high school students and students in university, it is also a question at home. When you have children who are asking questions, and in Israel, the Holocaust is has a very a constant presence. It's, it is present in public life, individual life, family life. It is being mentioned every day, every day, in the media, in one way or another, in movies, in theater plays, in literature, in relations among the generations, second generation speaking to their parents. Now we have a third generation. And so, it is there, and you cannot avoid it. You can't run away and say, okay, we don't teach it, and we don't do anything. Even children in the kindergarten, when they hear the same ring once a year, but if they hear it, all they hear is the same ring once a year on a certain day, and then we all stand up and stop doing anything else, goes on for two minutes, then we start the Memorial Day, National Memorial Day. Young children, even in kindergarten, they hear it. And they come to the teachers and they say, what is it about? Why is I real? And why I saw my parents looking at this and that and go, oh, wow, wow. Okay. And so in Yad Vashem, in the Memorial Authority, we, under the pressure, Teachers in kindergarten and in early schools, especially in high school, we made a whole curriculum, a whole plan that you can teach from a very from kindergartens up to rescue. Okay? It doesn't say much about the general situation very carefully. And it goes a bit more and more and more until at the end of high school. Again, not the full picture, but closely. So there is a plan that you are all in, if you wish, you're all invited to use. You can enter the Yad site, which is very rich with materials, with movies, with testimonies, with everything, and take it from there. The other question about genocide denial is really a heavy one. Almost every major crime perpetrated is being denied by the perpetrator. Absolutely. Or their sons, or their those who have an interest to, to, to deny it. So it's a problem. And I heard it's a problem here as well. And we certainly have. Uh, are facing, we are facing in the world, all of those deniers who say, ah, six million, it's not logically, it can be, if it's impossible, it's a Jewish story, you wanted to, you wanted to hold Germany by its throat and get money, compensations from Germany, which we got, uh, and so, survive they deny what can you do against one major tool is legislation there are already 18 countries in the world that forbid the denial of genocide it 